One of my favorite prayers in our Book of Common Prayer is called the General Thanksgiving. It's found on page 836 of the prayer book. So if you want to ignore me for the next 10 or 12 minutes, just read this prayer, think about it. That'll essentially be the gist of this sermon. But one of my favorite parts of this prayer is when we say, we thank you, God, for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. That's the feel-good part of this prayer. God, thank you for helping us have all these accomplishments and successes. But, but, the prayer continues, we thank you also for the disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. In other words, God, thanks for the times things go wrong. That's a tougher prayer to offer. We thank you also for the disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. What this prayer is really acknowledging is that there can be a danger to uninterrupted success. Achievement and success and accomplishments can lead to pride. And that's exactly what we read about in the Old Testament passage today, the story of Absalom and his fatal flaw, his pride. Absalom was one of King David's sons. He was known for his exceptional charm and for his good looks, especially, frankly, for his long, luscious, flowing hair. Absalom was sort of a combination of Prince William, after all, he was a prince, and Fabio. <laughs> For those of you who are unaware, Fabio was an Italian actor slash model with this same long flowing hair. If you've ever walked by a bookstore and looked at the romance section and wondered, who is this same model who's on the cover of every book? And on this book, he may be in a sailboat, on this book, he may be on a beach with a sunset in the background, but in every one, he's got this long flowing hair. The answer, that's Fabio again and again. You see, Fabio and Absalom apparently had the same hair care routine or hair products. But for Absalom, his long flowing hair became sort of his calling card. He was known for it, he was recognized by it, and he was very, very proud of his hair. Unfortunately, pride is not a sin that was only around in the Old Testament. Pride still shows up in the world today. We don't have to look very far to see it around us. In 1984, Elizabeth Holmes was born. As a child, she had an interest in technology and science. As a teenager in Houston, she was known for her drive and her ambition. And then she went to Stanford where she, studied, where she studied chemical engineering. And even among this group of super high achievers, Elizabeth Holmes was a standout. In 2003, she dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 to pursue her vision full time. And she used her tuition money to start a company called Ther um, Theranos. All of her success for this th first 19 years of life began to lead to this slow ballooning or growing of her pride. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. C.S. Lewis continues, pride is competitive by its very nature. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that we're proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but this isn't really true. We are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became 
equally rich or clever or good-looking, there wouldn't be anything to be proud of. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above those around you. For Elizabeth Holmes, with her new company, Theranos, she had a vision to revolutionize technology with a device that could use just a couple drops of blood to run comprehensive testing. There was so much optimism and excitement. Holmes secured over $700 million from investors for her company. Her board of directors was sort of the who's who of the who's who, including Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, former secretaries of state, and James Mattis and William Perry, former secretaries of defense. She started partnerships with companies like Walgreens. Soon Theranos was valued at over nine billion, that's billion with a B, dollars. Elizabeth Holmes was cast as a visionary, becoming one of the youngest self-made billionaires in the world. And all of this success led to her pride growing and growing and growing. You see, the danger for so many of us is we, come, we, we become so proud of something, we become so proud that we're willing to sacrifice anything. This pride becomes all-consuming. Elizabeth Holmes was so proud of her success that she lost sight of the good that she had wanted to do when she first started out. She was so proud of her success that she was willing to sacrifice whatever it took to continue to achieve and maintain this success. It was later revealed that Elizabeth began to bend some rules. She began to hide facts from regulators. She began to stretch the truth. Her ambition, her pride, overtook all her values and principles. And frankly, that's similar to what happened to Absalom. Absalom was handsome and powerful, charismatic, and a good politician. And as he became more and more successful, he also became more and more proud of his successes. He moved out of Jerusalem to the cool hill country of Hebron, where he was also outside the, the close watchful eye of his father. Being a good politician, Absalom won the hearts and the minds of the Israelites. Absalom's pride and ambition began to grow. You see, his pride wasn't just a state of mind. His pride began to drive his actions, his decisions, and how he interacted with others. He sought more power through cunning and manipulation. Eventually, he declared himself the king of Hebron. He rebelled against his father, and he, he threw his country into a civil war. His pride began to drive his actions. For Elizabeth Holmes, her pride also began to direct the actions she took. She had set lofty goals for Theranos, but she soon realized they weren't being achieved at the rate that she wanted. So she started to exaggerate the capabilities of her company's blood testing technology, publicly claiming that Theranos devices could run comprehensive tests with just a few drops of blood. Claims that it turns out were completely untrue. You see, with both Absalom and with Elizabeth Holmes, pride quickly became more than just a state of mind. Pride began to drive how they interacted with the world. And we're all subject to that danger. Pride can become an action verb in any of our lives. And generally, pride doesn't lead to good actions. So we should start by being aware of where we are each individually susceptible to become prideful. What are the things that you are so proudful of, or so, pr so proud of, that you might be willing to sacrifice your values or your principles or your morals? 
Where does pride come up in your life? What are you most proud of? You see, if we can start by being aware of our own potential for pride, we can then better guard against this seductive power that pride can have in our lives. After all, pride often sneaks into our lives in slow and subtle and and incremental ways. Absalom, when he moved to Hebron, started out by trying to be a man of the people. He wanted to do good. He had good intentions. The Bible tells us that he sat at the city gates. He listened to people's grievances. He offered consolation. He promised justice. But then, as his popularity grew, his pride also incrementally grew. He eventually rebelled against his father, King David, thrusting this country into civil war. In the passage that we read just a few minutes ago, Absalom found himself in a battle with King David's armies. And as as the tide of the battle began to turn against Absalom, Absalom fled from the battle, riding not a horse, but riding a mule. He rode under an oak tree, we read. Now this oak tree apparently had low, scraggly branches, and Absalom's long, flowing hair was caught up in the branches of this tree. And as his mule trotted forward, Absalom was left hanging in this tree, above the ground, unable to free himself. And when David's armies caught up, we read that they killed Absalom. You see, Absalom's hair was the symbol of his pride. And this symbol of his pride was the direct cause of his demise. Elizabeth Holmes started out with the goal of developing a technology that would revolutionize medical data collection and could potentially help detect and and protect people from life-threatening ailments. Like Absalom, she set out to do good. She became the youngest and wealthiest self-made woman billionaire in the United States. But then her pride took over and she lied about her company's technological capabilities and she defrauded investors. And today Elizabeth is in prison. C.S. Lewis said, pride always means enmity. Enmity is in being in conflict or being the enemy of someone else. It is enmity. And it's not only enmity between person and person, but enmity to God. In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. And as long as you're proud, You cannot know God. A proud person is always looking down on people and things. And as long as you're looking down, of course, you cannot see something that is above you. Now, there's pride in each of us. And pride isn't always bad. We can have pride in our countries, in our country, which as of this morning has won 123 medals at the Olympic Games. We can have pride in St. John's Cathedral, um, in all that we do to reach out into our community and share God's love and serve our neighbors. We can have personal pride in our jobs or the work we accomplish or our families or those we love. However, we find ourselves on particularly shaky ground if we let our pride become our motivation for our actions and our decisions. And if we find that our pride is driving how we interact with those around us. So it's good. It's good even to have moments in our life when we have disappointments or when we have failures or when we realize that we can't or shouldn't totally rely on our own pride and our own accomplishments. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you to do something different this morning. I'm going to ask you to take out your prayer book. It's the red book found in the pew back in front of you, and turn to page 836. 
page 836. And on page 836, I will invite you to pray with me aloud paragraphs three and four of the general thanksgiving. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. I invite you to think about that prayer as you go through this week. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Amen.